There it is. Testing, testing, testing. Does that sound like it's on? Okay. Let's see if that works now. I think this might need a battery change. Oh, hold on. Oh, the on switch. It's always what plagues me. That and the plug, you know, yeah. <laughs> Things aren't supposed to have on-off switches. <laughs> They're supposed to automatically work. All right, give me a signal whenever we're ready to go. All right, well, let me open us up by praying. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to worship you. We pray that in this class that you would be magnified and that we would be able to think clearly about what you have revealed in your word about your character, and that even with the help of historic catechisms and statements of theologians, that these would help and not hinder uh, towards seeing those contours, toward seeing the great mystery of all that you have revealed and, and uh, seeing the limits uh, where beyond that you have not revealed. So we pray that we would look into these things as those who are uh, seeking exactly what you have revealed and seeking to worship you and to reverence you and not to speculate in ways that would reduce you to the creature for the sake of maybe getting quick answers or whatever it is that is in our hearts and our wrong motives. We pray that we would learn these things, that we would be better in explaining them to others, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this uh, fourth question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I, I might not be right about this, but I'll say it anyway. This, at least this one, question four, will be the one that we, we're going to do two parts. I could not, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know why the Westminster Divines only had one question about the nature of God. I know it's the shorter catechism, and there's probably experts in the Westminster Assembly that could tell you why and all that stuff, but um, because of that, I think it's wise to uh, distinguish between, uh, we're going to talk about different attributes, classifications for attributes of God, and you see that in this answer, and so we're going to divide this into uh, part one, part two, uh, this week and next week. And so here's the whole question and answer. What is God? 
And the answer is God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. Wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So as I briefly hinted at, there's several ways to classify uh, the attributes of God in a study of systematic theology. And the way that I find most helpful is a way that I think you can discern even in this answer. If you see everything um, where it says up to in his being before that versus those after it, you, you do see something, even if maybe you don't know the, the terms that are used by theologians, but this is a division that is often referred to as the difference between the incommunicable attributes of God as opposed to the communicable attributes of God. And, and that doesn't mean that he doesn't communicate anything about the first set and he does of the second set. That's not quite what those words mean. Um, now, and it's not a neat and tidy division either. None of these classifications are perfect or not without their uh, difficulties, but they are generally helpful. Uh, one theologian, uh, W.G.T. Shedd, uh, says something about this. He says, the incommunicable attributes are those that belong to God exclusively so that there is nothing resembling them in a created spirit. They admit no degrees, but are divine by their very nature. And stop right there. By saying they admit no degrees, he's not saying they admit no analogies. If, if he said that, that would be wrong because then we couldn't talk about them at all. And we can talk about them, but what he's saying is that human beings are not these in any sense, okay? So that, that's the idea here. Uh, such are self-existence, simplicity, infinity, eternity, immutability. That's not even an exhaustive list. That's just, he's just giving you examples of what he means. Now, the communicable attributes are those which are possessed in a finite degree, more or less, by men and angels. So, this is, I think, the, the dominant classification that theologians will use, especially uh, in more modern times. But, uh, well, that even, that's even uh, varies in, in different times. But I, I, this, this is probably the majority way to classify. The others are not wrong. They just have, I think, more difficulties. Um, but whatever way one classifies the attributes of God, one thing that we must not do is to make a division between those attributes of God that belong to God's being versus others that are his relationship to other things, but still inside of him. So theologians have done that in the modern world. Even those in the Reformed Church in the last hundred years have gotten into the habit, and we'll talk about why that is maybe, of, and it's almost like three classes of attributes of God, uh, where we uh, speak of uh, God's essence in himself, and then we speak of maybe God doing something. So we say, for example, that God is um, the friend of Abraham, okay? And we say, well, that's a relationship. That's not something God had to be in himself, right? Uh, because Abraham didn't have to exist. But then some of these more modern theologians have sort of played with that a little bit too much and kind of smoothed it over to where there's a third attribute in the middle where the, there are things in God that change in relation to the creature. And classical theologians would have said, that's a no-no. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, there's only what God is in himself versus manners of speaking in relation to God where all of the change, all of, all of those things are happening outside of God. And that matters for things like how could God create without things changing in him? Or how can the incarnation be without there being change in the divine? All sorts of questions that come up at some point where you have to make this distinction between God's, what's called his inner life, you'll see the, word, the Latin words in se, in himself, or ad intra, versus God, speaking about God, ad extra, or speaking about his works outside of himself. This gets into the deep end of the pool. Um, but the Bible speaks in a narrative form, and so it will often speak about God, as we'll see in the text of Jonah today, in a way, in, in the form of a man, what's called an anthropomorphism, as, as if he were a man. God turns, God looks. It'll even attribute body parts to him. 
where, where he says the eyes of the Lord, or in a, well, he doesn't have eyes, or the hand of the Lord, his right arm. Well, he just doesn't have a hand, he doesn't have a body. But it is telling us something true, but it's doing so through that medium, through the form of as if he were a man, because it is easier for us to understand that. That's why he's doing it. He's not lying, nor is he telling us on the other extreme that he literally has a hand. It's referring to his power to save. Uh, and we can get into things like that. But that's very crucial. So in this first part, we're talking about the incommunicable attributes of God. So I have some pictures, and when I have pictures, I'm well aware of the second commandment. And so none of these pictures are going to be attempts to depict what God is. In fact, I've restricted by the use of these X's that are going to be everywhere in these pictures, what must not be, how we must not think, what must be ruled out. So we're going to look at these first two attributes together namely the spirituality of God and the infinity of God. And we can see right away the influence of Calvin on the Westminster Assembly because in his institutes, the Genevan reformer had only really unpacked these two divine attributes, the spirituality of God and the infinity of God. If you look in those sections of book one of the institutes, that's what Calvin does. And a lot of people take that in the wrong way. And this is important for Reformed theology moving on forward because some people can get this idea that Reformed theology is fundamentally different than classical theology before Reformed theology. This has been taken in recent decades to suggest that people like Calvin were rejecting classical theology, completely rejecting scholastic theology and its speculative method or thinking about God in terms of what he is not and talking about all the, in other words, having a big section in the front of your theology book about all the attributes of God. But Calvin was against this. Um, it is true that Calvin had quite a bit to say about the impertinence of theological speculation. In other words, speculating about God like even those pagan philosophers do. We, we don't want to do that. That's, that's impious. That's prideful and so forth and so on. But that's actually not what Calvin was doing here in only talking about those two attributes. Anyone who takes the trouble to read that section will see that what the reformer is doing is he is making an argument against Rome's use of idols or icons or images. You say, well, why would he do that in his Doctrine of God section? What, what does that have to do with these attributes of God? Well, think of it. There are no two attributes of God that are more directly lied about in the making of images and the crafting of images and icons than the spirituality and the infinity of God. Um, I was going to say, think of an idol. Well, you don't do that, but just think, see when I have a circle there. I'm not saying that God is a circle, but let's say we tried to say that he was or just think of some Roman icon or something like that. The problem is that if I draw a line anywhere and I actually mean that God stops there or that he has physicality, that he does literally have an arm or something like that, then I am saying that God is finite or God is physical. And so we have to rule out by saying that God is spirit, we are ruling out most obviously that he has a body. Okay, what did Jesus say after he rose? That a spirit does not have flesh as you see that I have. So the first obvious thing we mean by God as a spirit is that God is not a body. But we don't just mean that. We also mean a bunch of other things. For example, when Jesus says in John 4.24, it's one of the verses that the Westminster divines use, God is spirit, there he does not mean specifically the Holy Spirit. There he means the divine essence as such, which, of course, the person of the Holy Spirit has as much as the Father and the Son have. So there we're speaking of one divine essence or the shared divine essence. God is spirit. We know that from the context because what's the context? Jesus is basically saying, therefore, you must worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, you worship him according to what he is like, not by some physical thing. And that was the whole point. And so 
God's spirituality has implications for worship. It has implications for what you, you look at and what you fix your mind on when you are worshiping God, okay? Uh, Thomas Watson uh, gives us a good answer to what it means that God is spirit. He says, by a spirit, I mean God is an immaterial substance. Uh, that's another thing I think we get, have to get used to in the modern world. When we think of the word substance, we think, we think of physical things. That's not what was meant uh, in classical thinking. It, it was a synonym for essence or being. So God is substance, in other words, real, of a pure unmixed essence, not compounded of body and soul, without all extension of parts. Watson says, the body is a dregish thing. The more spiritual God's essence, the more noble and excellent it is. And that brings up another attribute that's not listed by name here, but it's referred to in in the confession and other places negatively, by saying that God has no parts or passions. So we'll talk about passions at some other point. The impassibility of God, another controversial um, attribute today, would not have been throughout the first 19 centuries of the church. And likewise, the simplicity of God. The simplicity of God refers to God not being composed of parts. So it means more than simply He's not a body. He's not composed of molecules or atoms. or that. That's true. He's not composed at all. He does not have parts. He's not even a metaphysical pizza pie or Legos or anything by which you can imagine God being part justice and part love. Well, he's, he's holy over there, but, but he's love over here. No, there is no here versus there in God, but all of God is holy, and all of God is love, and so forth. So the simplicity of God simply means that He's not composed of parts. We can go deeper into that, but, but just have that in mind. There's two other attributes that this spirituality of God immediately implies, and that is what the older thinkers would have called divine immensity, but we think of that in spatial terms too but also the omnipresence of God, that he's per- He doesn't just fill all things, but He is personally present everywhere. That has immediate implications for His knowledge of all things, and there's a lot of practical implications of that. But immensity belongs to God in His essence, whereas omnipresence is this same attribute in relation to creatures in space and time. So Francis Turretin, another Reformed theologian, says, when God is said to ascend or descend, or to go away, or come. It is not said with respect to his essence, but only to the absence or presence of his divine operations. So in other words, even there, when he said, like at the Tower of Babel, let us go down, that's more anthropomorphic speech. God doesn't actually need to go down for a better look anyway. Nor if he needed to, would he have to go down to to go there? But God is everywhere present. Why is he doing that then in Genesis 11? Well, he's doing that for our benefit, to peer down as if to say to us, what are those little ants doing now? Um, it, it's, a, it's a manner of speech to show us our comparative smallness, especially in our rebellion, that we're pathetic little creatures when we would dare to rebel against him. He isn't having us say, oh, God needs to get a better view. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> it's a manner of speech to make things simple. This is the fullness of divine spirituality. Ephesians 1.23 speaks of the fullness of him who fills all in all. So even of Christ, he ascends, but the upshot is that in his divine essence, the Son never ceased to be the divine Son. And as such, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fills all in all. Or in Jeremiah 23, verse 23 He says, am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? That's a rhetorical question. He does. Now, the concept of infinity, even as you think about spirituality in those those respects that we did, you're immediately also (coughs) thinking of the infinity of God. Really, his omnipresence is his spirituality um, conceived 
in the infinite. But we can get wrong ideas about the infinite as well. Um, what we have in mind when we're speaking of the infinity of God, when, when we're speaking of that word, because we can use those words like a number line. We can use it figuratively, comparatively, negatively, positively. We can use it in different ways. And mathematicians would tell you there, there's an infinite uh, amount of infinities. Um, so there's all sorts of ways we can use the word, but so when we use it here, we're not using it in any of those ways because those are still with respect to things which are either creaturely or things which are divisible. So when we speak about God, infinite, we're speaking of that limitless or boundless essence. One medieval theologian, Boethius, even defined the, um, oh, he's the eternity of God, so I'll, I'll cheat. But you can apply it here too as the boundless life of God. So I like that word, and a lot of theologians do, of the limitlessness of God, that he cannot be limited. Uh, Burkhoff offers this as a concise definition. He says, the infinity of God is that perfection of God by which he is free from all limitations. Some of these attributes you might look at at first and say, well, so is that something God can't do? You're saying he can't lie. He, he can't do this. and can't. That seems limiting. Um, you might think that about some of these things, but actually for him to do the opposite would be a contradiction in terms, and that would actually be the real limitation. We'll get that sense as we go, but he's free from all limitations, and that includes the limit that would be implied if we could theoretically see all of him or think about all of him. And so, Psalm 145, verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable. So his infinity implies the incomprehensibility of God, which, by the way, doesn't mean that we can't know anything about him if he chooses to reveal himself as he has. But it speaks of comprehensiveness that we cannot exhaust. We use the expression, we can only scratch the surface. That's more analogical speech, but that's what's implied there. His greatness is unsearchable. Bavink, in his Reform Dogmatics, adds to this. It's more implications of infinity. He says, when applied to time, God's infinity is called eternity. When applied to space, it is called omnipresence. Infinity is not a negative, but a positive concept. It means not that God has no distinct being of his own, that's another thing you might think. Well, if he's infinite, then, then that crowds out other things. Then, then all is God. That, that people get that idea that infinity, taken literally, would imply pantheism or something like that. It's like, that's a confusion of concepts. So Bavink is dealing with that. He's saying, it means not that God has no distinct being of his own, but he, he is not limited by anything finite and creaturely. In other words, when you think like that, well, if he's infinite, then it just crowds things out. You're already cheating and thinking of him in spatial terms or in terms of mass or whatever else. Um, but, but all other beings are not like him in the sense that he pervades all things anyway. So in other words, infinity is not fundamentally about time or space or number or sequence or anything like that, but of essence. Uh, Charles Hodge, uh, in agreement with this idea of limitlessness of being, says that infinity is a positive idea and not merely a negation. So all the theologians are, are bringing that up, that it is first positive. And that's important too, as you go through any of the divine attributes, is that they are first positive. The trouble is we're finite in our minds, and so we can only approach that by negation at that point. Now, that gets into a whole thing that's misleading as well. There's, there's three ways that classical theology would speak of, three ways in which we know God or can speak of him. But when, what we're seeing here is by way of negation. And I bring this one up because it's very practical. The easiest thing in the world to do is to define God in terms of the creature. And in an in a, in a introductory sense, we can't avoid that. God condescends to our level so that we are speaking in the creaturely. However, we need to always keep in mind that when we do that, we are only speaking analogically about God. And what happens is if we don't have that in mind, <coughs> we might say, 
just as one example, C.S. Lewis brought this up in his book, The Four Loves, that the idea that God is love can slyly come to mean that love is God. You say, well, isn't it? If A is A, then A is A. I'm just, you know, <laughs> shifting around. Um, no, because when you think of love and when I think of love, our hearts are idolatrous. And the moment we say that, well, if God is love, love is God, and I love you and you love me, and therefore we can't be sinning here, ah, you see what we do? We're, we're immediately cheating. Well, if my God would never do that. My God would save all. My God would do this, don't put God in a box, and so on and so forth. And the person who says that has already put God in his own box. Okay, but what we're doing is we're demanding that God answer to the creature. If God is love, he would do this, this, and that with respect to the creature. Do you know what you're saying when you say that? You're an atheist. And here's why. Because you're saying that God's love owes its nature to that thing in creation. If God is just, he owes, oh, I don't want to say that. Yeah, that's what you're saying. You're defining God, you're shaping God, you're reshaping God in terms of something in the creature. So, putting the concept of spirituality together with the concept of infinity, we arrive at the omnipresence of God only by relating that fullness of divine being to the creature. So it's we must relate the concepts about God to the creature, but we have to be careful that we don't define God by the creature. And it's a very subtle switch to make if we're not careful. We have to always be ruling things out, as Scripture tells us to. So Hodge adds to this, this, of course, is not to be understood as the spirituality of God pervading all, not to be understood as extension or diffusion. So when we say God is everywhere, so when we think of something spreading out, when our mind starts to go that way, we're thinking of like something like perfume. It's, it diffuses if it's spreading out more. With God, he does not lose any of his being as a, as a result of being here, there, and everywhere. Extension, Hodge says, is a property of matter and cannot be predicated of God. If extended, he would be capable of division and separation. A part of God would be here, and a part elsewhere. But of course, as we've seen, God is simple being and not composed, not divisible. Isaiah 40, verse 13 and verse 18 says, Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord? To whom then will you liken him? Or what likeness compared with him? So that's a lot for the first two attributes. You can go a lot further than that, but I don't know how to make the infinity of God and spirituality of God more... Um, more surfacey than that, because it's, uh, there's a lot to think about. Likewise with the eternity of God, the third, um, sorry, the third attribute that's mentioned there, the eternity of God. This, too, is not first a negation. It's positive. In other words, it's not simply a negation of time. It's not simply a relation of time at all. Now, it immediately has implications for time, because we're in time. So we do have to think about it that way. So we use the word atemporal, for example. If you ask me, what is eternity? And I say, well, it's, it's atemporality. He's not bound to time. That's true. It is that. But it's that in relation to time. So there we're speaking by analogy. We're still only skimming the surface. And that, I think, is where Boethius' definition is very helpful, that eternity, God's eternity, that eternity that's essential is boundless life limitless life. Time is a relation to it, but not the other way around. What the Bible does in speaking of divine eternity is it places it in our setting for our immediate understanding. So, for example, the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So one synonym you could use for eternity is everlasting. If you understand that that synonym is only in its relation to time. Eternity, essentially in God, is not simply God's duration through all things, because God is not contained or inside of all things to begin with. 
So it implies things for the duration of his life in relation to the world. But it doesn't start there. And as with all these attributes, it starts to explode our head when we think about that. But in Scripture, some things are called eternal. Some things are called everlasting in a secondary sense. And so that's one of the first ways to get at this and arrive at it is to notice that. So for example, most famously, there is eternal life that God gives to his saints. I give them eternal life, John 10, 28. Or John 5, 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now, is Jesus saying that we, that we possess, we gain the divine attribute of eternity? No, of course not. So it has to be in some secondary way that we are now participating in eternity. We are being given or included in that everlastingness, but we don't become the attribute of God. There's also an everlasting covenant, Genesis 17.7. There's even things like everlasting hills in Deuteronomy 33.15. So clearly, not all senses of the eternal are the same. And even when we grasp that God alone has eternity in the most proper sense, we have to make a further qualification. Our next question might be, okay, I get the difference between God and creatures being brought into this, but now what do we mean? Is God in eternity? That might be our first thought. He's in heaven. And we might be thinking spatially or something like that, locally. Or is eternity in God? But we're still thinking spatially. Or is all that is in God eternal. Okay, so there I think we move closer to the idea. He uses the language that, that he does in Scripture so that we can understand, so that we can build our minds up to see that all eternity is to be conceived, as this answer says, in his being. These incommunicable attributes are his being, and that's one of the implications, too, for the simplicity of God, is that all of these attributes are, first and foremost, all that is in God. For instance, Isaiah 41, 4, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. Or in Revelation, three times in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. In, in, in chapter 1, verse 8, it says, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Is He only saying, I was that old, I am here now, and I will always be? Well, that's true, too. But that's not where it starts. But he gives us that language of eternity in terms of number so that we can start to understand it. All right? And then fourthly, the immutability of God, or as it says in the catechism answer, unchanging. He's immutable. I like that word, and unchangeable. I like that ending because we're not just saying that he does not change. Well, because he wills it, he, he won't change, and we can bank on it. Well, that's true, but the reason we can bank on it is that he is not able to change. He cannot change. According to Shedd, this implies the unchangeableness of God's essence, his attributes, purposes, and consciousness. If God is immutable, if he does not change, then not only does his essence not change, but his consciousness does not change. His purposes do not change. And so, not only does this imply that both the incommunicable attributes and the communicable attributes, these ones that seem more abstract, but then also his personal attributes do not change. His love never changes. His justice never changes. But as Charnock says, no new nature, new thoughts, new will, new purpose, or new place. And so in the scriptures, he says in Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. He is called the Father of lights in James 1, 17, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Or in Psalm 102, verse 26 and 27, the heavens will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. 
But you are the same, and your years have no end. Now, if we take all this seriously, if we take divine immutability seriously, we are on a collision course with modern theology. Because modern theology, and it even affects the Reformed Church, but modern theology tries to make God more personal and tries to make the narrative of Scripture more relatable and to take it more seriously by pulling God down from the heavens, by making Him always imminent, always, in other words, more literally like a man, and not just in those forms so that we can understand it, but He really means. And they won't say He really has an arm. He really ha-. They won't say that, but He really does change His mind. He really doesn't know what's going to happen. He really, can't, he really wasn't there. He didn't do that. And so that's what they're saying. But if we're going to say that all of God's will is immutable, then we must follow through and say that all of God's decrees are immutable. To put a finer point on it, that means that God's determination to do all that He does cannot ever change. Remember that in the Jonah passage today in Jonah 3.10, and I'll cover it. All that he intends to do, he does. It cannot change. It cannot change by anything in time. It cannot change by anything in eternity. And lest anyone think that this is impractical, the scriptures say that, Hebrews 6.17, God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. What's going on there is Abraham's in doubt. God wants to show him and assure him and say that these promises are sure. How does he do that? He shows him the immutability of God through the immutability of the promises. Everywhere else, he says, Isaiah 46.10, My counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. Or again in Psalm 33.11, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Or Psalm 110 verse 4 about Christ. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And finally, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So in all of this, the incommunicable attributes of God, however abstract they may appear at first glance, these are the ones that provide an anchor All the ones we may be thinking of that are more personal, more moral, um, more down-to-earth. They are what they are, and we can bank on them in the gospel precisely because all that is in God is God. And so uh, with that, very deep stuff today, um, let me open it up to questions. So, I mean, this is such a massive (coughs) subject and really beyond our comprehension. <clears throat> but one of the questions I have is, um, so hell was kind of, we often heard that hell is a place where you're eternally absent from God, separated yeah. from God. Yeah. But God's um, omnipresent. Mm-hmm. So how does that work? Yeah. So there's, if you look at all the set of verses about the nature of hell, some of them speak of that alienation from God. Which shouldn't surprise us, of course, because all the way back in Genesis 2 and forward, the curse of God has at its heart separation from him, alienated from the life of God, Ephesians 2. But that's only a part, and those passages are not meant to be exhaustive of all that is true about hell, because it's also part of the nature of the curse to have God personally cursing. And so Romans 1.18, that the wrath of God is presently revealed from heaven against all the unrighteousness of men. So God is both separating sinners from himself and present to curse. And I think that's the key in putting the two concepts together, is that they are covenantally separated from God. Uh, One Puritan said, and I forget which Puritan it was, that heaven is the presence of God with a mediator. Hell is the presence of God without one. And I think that is a good explanation of how we can be covenantally separated from God and yet literally and metaphysically always in His presence. And and to be in the presence of God without a mediator is, is the great terror of the unbeliever.
All right. Uh, with what you've been discussing, you may have to also amplify my question for the audience, but how is this impacted by the concept of middle knowledge? Doesn't that seem to fall away? Yes. With what with the, the topics you have, yeah. a shorter question, four mm -hmm. is a disaster for them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that they, well, there's a, it's a very deep concept that they want to they wanna drill there, and they'll use passages like Jonah 3.10, which we'll see in the, in the service. But middle knowledge is basically, and, you know, others have toyed with this, but it's also called Molinism after the Jesuit theologian Louis de Molina. This is the uh, early uh, 17th century. And um, the idea is that there are... Um, God's knowledge consists of his natural knowledge and his free knowledge. So everybody would recognize this, that there are, there are, there is, there are things which God knows must be his natural or necessary knowledge, starting with himself. These, all these attributes we're talking about must be. And if, um, and if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then Socrates is immortal. So all logical things, even of created things, are necessary truths or mathematical truths. But then there's also the free knowledge of God, which is God's knowledge of what would be the case if a possible world were initiated. There's a lot of possible things God could have done in the world. God knows those possibilities too. We call that his free knowledge because he's free to either do that or not do that. So let me back up a step. In his natural or necessary knowledge, there's those things that must be the case. God must be um, omnipotent. He, can, he cannot will himself, nor would he, will himself to not be omnipotent. So that belongs to the natural knowledge or necessary knowledge. And then there's the free knowledge of God, knowledge of all possibilities, which he's free to either enact or not enact. So what people, so what's the motive of the Mullenist or the person that believes in middle knowledge? He wants to create a third category. Why is he doing it? He wants to create a third category of middle in between those because he is worshiping his free will. He wants to create a scenario where God does save and respond and do all those things that you're thinking of in that, in that first category that he knows will be the case, but he does it in response to what we will do. So uh, really, um, Molinism is motivated by what later became the, the prescient view of the Arminian that God, yeah, free now, or sorry, um, predestination is a thing, but it means that God uh, chooses those who would choose him, who exercise faith. And so this gets really complex in saying that there are antecedent decrees of God and consequent decrees of God. So that, yes, God decrees all. So these people are paying lip service to things that are in classical theology, but they want to make room for free will to affect God's decrees. And that's an impossibility because God's decrees are what cause all things that happen um, by direct or through secondary causes. But they're always God's decrees happening, which um, the confession gets more explicitly into than the, than the catechism does. Um, but read the beginning of chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession, the very beginning part of it, about God's decree and it, the total scope of it and the fact that that doesn't erase secondary causes like free actions, it's the only thing that explains free actions of the creature, as if God is upholding their existence and their thoughts and their motives and their will. So this is the, so there's the deep end of the pool and then there's, the, there's like the, <laughs> the deeper part of the deep end of the pool. And the Molinus unfortunately forces us to go there because, um, because we have to have an answer here. And I know a lot of people who are, who uh, maybe hearing this for the first time, and they're like, oh man, maybe they have a point. And today, William Lane Craig is like the main proponent of uh, this idea of Mullenism or middle knowledge. It's complete nonsense, and there's no reason to create this third category. You, you, I just told you their, their motive. But um, everything in the free choice of man and the consequences, either blessing or cursing, depending on what you do, and we'll look at it in Jonah 3 today, all of those fit in with a combination either of God's necessary knowledge or his free knowledge. It belongs to necessary knowledge in the logical relationship. If you believe, you will have life. That's a, that's a logical relationship that belongs to his necessary knowledge. Um, whether person X believed, 
that is something that God did not have to decree. And so that fits in. So you see how it's a combination of his natural knowledge and his free knowledge. This third category is mindless. It does not need to exist to begin with. It's, it's done for the sake of making room for their free will. Yeah. <laughs> you wonder why this question wasn't actually question one in the shorter categories. Because everything starts with God. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's right. It's uh, the whole question of where do you start a theology book at? And there's debates about that, whether you start with Scripture, because that's how we know God, or do you start with God, because that's, he's where everything comes from, including Scripture. And, um, and it's always good to keep that exercise going of, well, both, depending on what your question is, uh, this one comes first. Um, yeah. I am glad that we got a chance to put the smack down on, on uh, Molinism. Um, and apply all these things to that. But we'll, we'll get, I mean, next week we'll talk about the communicable attributes of God, and there's a lot of wrong ideas even about those. So, all right, let me, let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. These deep and mysterious things, you say in your word that uh, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. We pray that you would keep in our minds where that boundary is, that we would not search into things that are too difficult for us, that, that don't belong to us. We know that you give us in your word things that are difficult for us, but in terms of prying into your mysteries as those who would wish that you would have decreed a different world than you have, restrain that evil in our hearts and teach us to better clarify these things for the, for the reasons that you have given to us to reveal these things in the first place. So we, we praise you for these deep and wonderful things. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.